，大家好，欢迎来到 I am Wesley Jones。Part two, a continuation of this video. Click here so you can get caught up and come back so you'll know what's going on. So I landed in LAX. I got home completely exhausted. I laid on my bed and I said, "What is going on here? This nothing makes sense. It, it just it's not adding up." All the signs said, "Don't go back to Ghana," and I. Did not plan on going back. Not only did I return with what I went through, I learned more about the governmental structure of Ghana, and the price points and prime locations in Accra, like East Lagoon cantonments. That's expensive. It's just like living in LA. I'm like, what? I came here to take advantage of the exchange rate and to see the cost of building and the cost of the land and prime locations. It was discouraging. I was like, I might as well stay in the states and do it here, or go to Atlanta and buy some land there. And it just, it just wasn't adding up, guys. Like I went to Ghana for another option to get away from the white power structure, but it's there too, just in a different way. The government, my my, this is, this is how I felt when I went to Ghana the first time, just by looking at the infrastructure. Ghana is one of the richest countries in resources, from supplying the world with cocoa for chocolate to oil, etc. The list goes on and on. You mean to tell me you won't build roads for your people, keep water consistent, and the electricity flowing? And I get it. We pay taxes for that luxury here. But for it not to flow and to even exist, I mean, what is the government doing? Infrastructure is like the the foundation. You lit, they literally have enough resources to build their own infrastructure. Then I had a light bulb moment. I said, "Oh, that's why they want the diaspora to come back, right? They want people with money to come back, or the people that can bring money to come back to build." Infrastructure, so they can continue to eat and slumber. It's all about money, folks, from the top to the bottom. I mean, that's why the Chinese, Lebanese, Europeans, the Americans—I mean, it goes to the highest bidder. Land goes to the highest bidder, and we can be mad about the Chinese being neo colonizers, but they are doing what we should be doing as diasporas, as people of the land. So how can we be mad? At a system that is money-driven, right? One, the diaspora are not coming at the rate that's needed to offset this, and two, land goes to the highest bidder. That's as that's as complicated as it gets. This is not a black and white thing. This is a money thing. Okay, so before I get started, I just want to say, the Ghanaian people. Are lovely. They are very welcoming. Every time I had a conversation with a the local, they excited me. They're like, "Oh my gosh, we're so excited for you to come back. We're gonna go to your resorts." I'm like, "Let's go." But the govern the but the governmental structure of Ghana. One word. Blackface. Let me break down blackface. Blackface is what non-Africans or low melanated people did. They painted their face black and made a mockery of the African culture for entertainment purposes, for profit. Okay, and so I mean, from the grocery stores to the restaurants, from the department stores to the banks, blackface. There's Africans running it. But non-Africans own it, and most of them don't even live in the country. And I'm like, what? And I know not all stores are going to be African-owned, but a huge majority of them are not. I would say like seventy to eighty percent, because I tried my best to spend my dollar, to spend my money at African-owned places. It was a challenge. 
So that's my macroeconomic opinion based on my experience and my knowledge. But that first experience, like, <laughs> brought me down back to earth, took me out of the clouds and was like, the white power structure is global. How do you not, <laughs> how do you not know this? <laughs> and that was the wake up I needed. So yeah, guys, to be, and you know, influencers make gonna look pretty, you know, and which it is, don't get me wrong. Hopefully you're hearing me correctly. But when you're on the ground floor in the dirt, literally and figuratively, life gets real, really quick. And that experience is what I needed, minus the molester tour guide. Emotionally, folks, emotionally, I was out for two days. I was depressed for like two days. I was just on my bed like, what is life? <laughs> What is life? So I prayed and meditated for like two days. I got myself together. I don't stay down long. Got myself together. I told myself I know the vision I had. Nothing is lining up. That means I am missing something. And that something, I don't know where it's gonna come from, how it's gonna come from, when, but I, what I do know is going to come unto me. And I was like, no, it's going to come unto me. I walk in the living room. My auntie and her boyfriend are watching. Pre-fabricated houses on YouTube. Did you, did you hear what I said? When I got myself together and got up, that was the first thing I saw. And I was like, affordable housing, still nice quality, Eco-friendly. This is the something I was missing. I sat there and watched a couple of videos. My mind was going a thousand miles per hour. I became obsessed. I became obsessed with the designing. I became obsessed with watching YouTube channels about fabric and um, prefab houses. Folks, I took off of work for a month and I all I did was design. And see, I went to school for drafting design technology. And in school they taught us more of product design, but we did take architectural design too as well. For my Autodesk people, I rented Revit for two months and I designed and designed and designed and went all the way in. I went in, you hear me? By the time I was done designing, I had a three-phase design layout. And that's how I got myself back up together and continued this journey. So my designs were done. I have no land. And that's where trip two and three come in. And if you want land details of my second and third trip, more on the business side, you can watch this video. Now I'm gonna to share to you why being aware and on guard doing business as a single woman in Ghana. In Ghana, during the land purchasing process, I've only dealt with men, okay? You don't have to do this, but I wear ring. I wear my rings on my wedding ring finger. Like I said, you don't have to do this, but I found that the second I'm introduced in a business meeting, and I open my mouth, they move from my face to my hand. And some of them are not even discreet about it. I'm, one time I had my hand like in a weird position where you couldn't, you couldn't see it. One guy was like, sir, can you be more discreet? I know people look at finger, ring fingers in the States, but they're kind of like, like discreet about it. <laughs> Men and Ghana are like, so why, Leslie, why do this? Because they need to deal with me on a business level, right? I, mean, I want to be treated professionally. I want, like, oh, maybe I can marry her out of, the, out of your mind. Because that's, that's another strong thing in Ghana, too. They, once they find out you're American, they're just like, oh, I will marry you. You will be my wife. I got so many proposals in Ghana. <laughs> Which I'm flattered, you know, but I don't want to be treated like that in a business meeting, okay? 
And so like, Leslie, how do you know? Because they talk to me differently when they think I'm married. And when they found out I'm not married, their body language, the way they speak, it just changes. You can feel it. Like, women, you know, you can just feel the aura shift. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's a tip. So I go to Ghana for the second time. And I buy an acre, March 2021, which I still don't have an indenture or a site plan for, by the way, and it's March 22. If you want to know the in-depth story, you can watch this video. So I found out that they moved my land without letting me know. So at this point, I want my money back. The land liaisons at the time said I'll have to pursue getting my money back on my own. They gave me contact information. I called the representative. I told them I wanted my money back. Come to find out I'm not getting my money back because moving my land without letting me know is not a breach of contract. And so I still want my money back, right? So we, I'm conversing, going back and forth. Then all of a sudden, he goes, I love you. I love you. I really, really love you. I mean, this was so much passion. You would think that we were married and I'm trying to ask for a divorce, okay? He said, don't disappoint me. Don't disappoint me. I paused in silence for a while because I am trying to figure out what is going on right now. Can you imagine calling your real estate agent and he confesses his love for you? I'm like, what world am I in? Sir, I met you three times. One time was on the property with the group on the land. The second and third time was in your office when I waited for hours for information I never got and we barely spoke. Where in the hell is this love confession coming from? No, 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 that's not what you say in business. So I told him, me disappoint you? the one that gave you money. So take all this passion and give me some photos of my land. Because I'm not getting my money back. I don't even know what my land looks like. I paid land liaisons to at least take pictures. Never got that. The only way I saw my land is he eventually sent a video. He was like, I'll send it to you tomorrow. I'll go to your land for you and send you a video. Which he did. But folks, where is the ethic customer service line when you need one? Where is the Bureau, Bureau of Labor to report to? It doesn't exist, okay? Since this conversation was on the phone, I don't have proof to show you, but I went through it. And trust me, if they call me again, I will be recording. But I do have proof of another situation with the same company, but with another representative. <laughs> you guys get ready. <laughs> okay, now it's my third trip. I plan my trip August 25th, and I plan a soil test in advance. I asked for the coordinates because the engineers need coordinates to run the soil test. We don't have site plans, so I can't give them a site plan. All this would have been easy peasy. So I asked the representative for coordinates. The one that confessed his love to me. I asked him for coordinates. This was his response. I don't have it. When will you be back in the country? Told him when I'll be back. Never gave me coordinates. That was July 12th. And then I asked him again July 15th. No response relating to the coordinates. So I asked the land liaisons. July 20th, they gave me coordinates to the best of their ability. And at least I can give something to the engineer at this point. So I give those coordinates to the engineer, confirm that it's enough to, to do the soil test. I thought it was confirmed. Fast forward to August 28th, we get to the land. Come to find out the coordinates are not enough to do the soil test and that there's only two of the six markers on the land. 
I said, okay. I call the line liaisons. They give me a number to the guy at the office that has the coordinates. I call, couldn't get a hold of him. The engineer calls, he got a hold of him. The coordinate guy said, I don't have the coordinates. They're at the office in my laptop. Okay, so I stood there on the land and I said, my time and money will not be wasted. I had to tap into the source. I was like, something's going to give. I started meditating and, pr meditating and praying and I'm like, Something has to give. Something has to come from somewhere to have to make. I didn't fly across the way from on the other side of the world not to have this done after prepping a month in advance. And then it happened. As I was meditating, the marker popped into my head. And I said, okay. I went to one of the markers. And there are numbers on the marker. I looked at the marker and I was like, that number matches the number on my receipt. I pull out my receipt. There were six numbers. And every one of those numbers was on a marker. So now I'm looking at all six marker numbers. I give the marker numbers to the engineer. Him and his crew start looking at all the markers. We found all six markers. They had their little coordinate gadget device thingy and we're able to pull on the coordinates with the satellite and that is how we got the soil test done ah my god it should even be all this but it is and that's that's the story so the soil test is done why, coordinate guy from Cos? Are you texting me, calling me, and sending me pictures after hours? I just want land. That's all I want. Leave me alone. And here's the proof. And if you look at the time, at this time I was in Ghana, so I'm back in the state, so the, it's a seven hour difference. But add seven hours to that, it's, it's after hours. And as you can see, I don't even know what, what, E-N-G, E-N-Y, what is that? Any Ghanaians out there? Is that a different language or is that a typo? And then the text, you know, the text messages, the text messages were getting later and later. And I said, you know what this is? This is like around dick pic time. And I said, I will not tolerate this. And I blocked them. Yeah. <sighs> Where is the ethics hotline? Where is the Bureau of Labor to report to? It doesn't exist in Ghana. And things like this, I started to appreciate in the States. And yes, we have scenarios like this in the States, but we have numbers to call, right? We, we have numbers to call. Mind you, I'm working with six Ghanaian companies simultaneously. Even though I plan meetings and everything in California, it was all my, always my intention to be there during operations. It was regardless, I was going, I just like to oversee stuff. Oversee. But I became a micro manager with all six companies. So, so now I'm going to share with you the business culture in Ghana. We're going to start with the soil testing company. Me and the engineer were talking a day before because we were going to meet the next day. So we're going over, over final details. We were talking about the soil testing. And out of nowhere, he goes, are you Christian? Do you believe in God? I'm like, we went from testing the soil, coordinate, to do you believe in God? Are you Christian? It's 
So I said, okay. In the States, we don't bring stuff up like that. Personally, I don't mind, okay? If it's if we're having a natural conversation, it, it leads into that, that's cool. But you came out of nowhere very awkwardly. And I'm thinking, if I was a man, or if even if I was a white man paying you for a service, would you do this? Would you, would you still be talking to him like this? Show me how great your God is by showing me how great your work is. Then we can talk about what I go to. Let's just say he never brought up God again. Okay, so that morning of the soil test, we get behind schedule because the videographers, they had a whole situation. We were behind like two hours and there's the traffic is horrible. So the soil testing, the lead engineer calls me and says, oh, we're just gonna wait for you because it's gonna be hard for you to get there. Not knowing I've already been to the area, but okay. Yeah, it's gonna be hard for you to get there, so we're just gonna wait for you. I said, oh, no, no, just go ahead and we'll, we'll find, it'll work out, we'll find you. He's like, no, no, we're gonna wait for you, we're gonna wait for me. I was like, no, just, just go ahead, okay? I said it for the third time. He's like, no, we're, we're gonna wait for you. I said, okay. We get there, we're stuck in, stuck in traffic. Ooh, traffic's really bad. I call him like, you know what? Can you just go, go there and just start? Cause you know, I I want this to be done in two days and not three. He's like, no, 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 we're, we're gonna wait for you. So, you know, we, you can get there together. I said, no, go. Mind you, this is the fifth time I'm saying it. He's like, let me, let me talk to someone in the car. Gave the phone to another guy. I'm assuming they speak the same language. He gets the phone back, he's like, oh, he says he's gonna wait for you. So I said, okay. Now I have to become that, I have to turn on my masculinity. Got the phone back, I said, this is the last time I'm gonna tell you. Go to the site now. Hung up, went to the site. Didn't say, didn't say another word, didn't say another mumbling word. And so I'm like, do I have to become that person to get things done? I guess so. So now I know I'm going to have to be masculine when I need to be masculine. Because as you already know, if I wasn't there, that soil test wouldn't have happened. Huh? Do not tell me you have everything you need when I'm on the other side of the world. And when I get there, you don't have what you need. And then you're asking me for things you need that I didn't even know you need. How am I supposed to, how am I supposed to tell you how to do your business? Huh? I am, I Uber drive in Los Angeles, waiting for my big break. But I'm supposed to be a foreigner telling you what to do in something that I have no clue of? It, it makes no sense to me. He's like, well, I assume. Assume? How do you assume someone that's not from your industry, that has never even touched soil in this manner, to tell you what to do in your job? Like, you need to tell me what you need so I can get it for you. If you don't tell me what you need, how am I supposed to know what you need, huh? Okay, and due to miscommunication, I end up paying more money for the service, which I shouldn't have, because the miscommunication was between the middleman and them, not me. A lesson learned, I micromanaged. The architectural firm. I took my designs to the architectural firm Beautiful job. They did a beautiful, ooh, I love them. I can't wait to share with them, share them with you. Um, but since the acre didn't work out, I had to change my design. And so I changed my design. I was like, will this cost anything? They're like, no. And then the designer, we kept on going back and forth on WhatsApp. He wasn't understanding my concept of the landscaping. So I had to go to the office, literally sit next to him and guide him, right? And eventually, you know, he understood what I meant and did a beautiful job. Oh, it, it's gonna cost. I don't mind paying, but don't tell me it costs nothing and then all of a sudden it costs. I had to micromanage. Artisan effects. Copy number three. Oh, Lord. folks, oh my. Do not ignore your intuitions. When I first met the videographer, it was virtually. I was in California, he was in Ghana. Imagine.
imagine you show up to an interview or someone's gonna pay you for a service and this person is slouched, murmuring, like, it's like, it's a salmon shit. And I was like, ooh, Leslie, he's slothful. Don't do it, Leslie. I ignored that voice and I said, you know what? I don't know anyone else. Like, who's gonna help me? I need someone there exactly when I land. And so I ignored that intuition. <laughs> Come to find out. You know, I said, okay, give me your work. Show me something that you've done just to make sure you guys know, you know, what you're doing. They ended up giving me a video. Later, I found out it wasn't their work. I emailed them. I said, is this a real business or you guys just made this up? Is it registered or you just made this up? Never returned my email. It was like pulling teeth. How do you show up to a shoot with a camera that doesn't work properly? How do you show up to meetings and equipment without them charged? How, how are you supposed to record the day? How? He said, "Oh, I'll have I'll have the video for you. I'll have the video for you the same weekend." Cool. It was almost a month and a half later. But it's crazy though. What's crazy is. This video, even from the comments, you guys kind of said like, what the heck, right? But this video is my second most watched video. But it was like pulling teeth. And I had to show up to the office and micromanage. Opinion, they got paid to learn. It was on the, on the job learning and getting paid. Because I'm sorry. You can't blame your camera not working. You blame yourself for not knowing how to work the camera. Assignment was complete. It was like pulling teeth, but we, we, we got through. Micromanaged. The editors. I gave him a shot list. Everything he needed, it was already outlined. He just had to put the footage in the specific place. He added footage from different recording days. <laughs> To it. How do you not follow an outline that someone's paying you to do? And you just insert, I don't know. And then the other guy, he was putting my pro brochures together. He didn't know what indentation was. I wanted him to indent. He didn't know what indent was. Woo! So I was like, we need to get the manager in here. So the manager came in and he had to show him what indent how to end in. <laughs> I had to show up weekly to help them with my videos. Micromanaging. Folks, I'm still working with all men. Where are the women at? My goodness. I want to work with women. Maybe that's a different, I'll have a different experience. And of course, if you guys have been following my journey, the developer of the beachfront property. Oh my, negligent. I had to clean up after him with my indentures several times. Oh, and then there's a the land commission. So now this is company number five, the land commission. If you've been following my journey, it was a mess. Incorrect information in databases. That was corrected. I micromanaged that. So I micromanaged the developer, micromanaged the lands commission, and of course, costs and, his, and their foolishness. So these are six companies I'm dealing with simultaneously. I made sure I scheduled my day to get to the location, get to the offices, correct paperwork. <laughs> ta, ta, ta. So yes, guys, be ready. Just be ready to micromanage and oversee your projects, period. And there's still much to learn. But what I do know, I won't be fooled in the same area twice. I didn't realize all the events I suppressed. I was so focused on getting my indenture that I forgot all these events. And once I got my indenture, you know, I didn't, I'm no longer in fight micromanaging mode. I can just 
calm down and write this web series, which I'm super excited for, so you excited for, so you guys can see the full story. And I know I explain things in a comical, joking manner, but I hope you take it to heart. I hope you um, learn from my mistakes, especially you single women, and be aware and be on, on guard of this patriarchal system in, in Ghana. Just based on what I've experienced, I'm pretty sure there's better stories out there, but this is my story, okay? And yes, just be aware and be on guard because it's a jungle in these streets and the thirst is real, okay? You know, we are cross-cultural functioning. What's unacceptable in one culture can be acceptable in the other but there are things that we should not tolerate at all and that is your body is your body no one owns it your space is your personal space it's a privilege for others to enter into it stay blessed Vision-reality.com is a system I developed to streamline the land purchasing process in Ghana. It took me over one year to find credible people to do business with in Ghana. This networking group are vetted professionals in the property development sector. I went through the good, the bad, and the ugly so others won't have to. I'm not only just referring people to this group, but I've purchased and completed the indenture process. So if someone goes to my website and they like the land they see and they end up purchasing it, I'm literally their neighbor. If you are do-it-yourself type, I will refer you to my networking group, provide a land purchasing checklist and price list, and you can start your journey. If you'd rather have an assistant, that will be me. Basically, do for you as I did for myself. I am a firm believer in leading from the front. I will only introduce you to people I have worked with for my land. The tab in the upper right corner will lead you to the land options. As I establish relationships with more chiefs and developers, the land options will increase. This will all start with a complimentary discovery call. I will share my experience with you, the land purchasing culture in Ghana, and confirm me being your land liaison is a good fit for you. The goal is to get the diasporas to repatriate or invest. If there's no methodical system, they're not coming back in the numbers that are needed. And what I mean by needed, there are non-African groups buying up land like hotcakes. There has been an incorrect narrative of the African continent, especially in the States, as poverty, sickness, and disease stricken, yet people are buying land, establishing businesses, and seeing drastic profits within five years. If the continent is such a disease-stricken place. Why are non-African foreigners relocating their whole lives and starting to build wealth for their families and their countries in Africa? Yet, the people of the land are scared or hesitant to invest. Vision to Reality Inc. is here to correct the narrative through streamlining the land purchasing process.